heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 226, covering the week of August 3rd through August 7th, 2020. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can find all those social media accounts at our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. While you're there, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook, Exploring the Southern Tradition. It's a great addition to your personal library. It includes 20 essays by Abbeville Institute scholars on a variety of topics in the Southern tradition, you're going to want it and you get it free of charge. Just for giving us an email address, you get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday for giving us that email address. And of course, anytime we need to contact you, we can do it through your email. It's a win-win situation. You can support the Abbeville Institute by going to abbevilleinstitute.org. Click on that support tab at the top of the page. You'll have donor options. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. All of that, of course, is tax deductible to the full extent of law, and it does help us keep the podcast going, the website going, our conferences, which we do have one coming up in October. Helps us keep those going. We have some other things we're working on, too. Hopefully, some of those things are going to come to fruition in the next month or so. We'll see. But, of course, all of that does support the Institute. Uh, and our books, we're in, a, we're in publishing now. So all these things, of course, are essential to exploring what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. You can also get your Abbeville Institute apparel by clicking on that shop tab. You can get your embroidered materials, high quality stuff. You're going to want it. It helps advertise the Institute. And of course, we get a little bit of change from that. And anytime you like our articles, anytime you like the podcast, anything you like that we do, please share it around on social media and rate this podcast wherever you get podcasts. It will help expand our message. And that is the most essential thing we can do in the modern day. We are a small minority, but I think a growing one. And there are a lot of people out there that think like us. They're just afraid to say it or they don't know. So many people feel alone and isolated because they have these thoughts and they think, well, you know, I don't necessarily agree with this or I don't understand what's going on here, but I'm the only one in my, fr- in my group of friends that thinks like this or nobody in my family thinks like this or maybe my family thinks like this, but nobody else in my neighborhood thinks like this. Whatever it is, You are not alone. You have friends. You have people that think like you. And so hopefully through this podcast and our website and some of the things we do, the events, uh, you don't feel alone. Now, the event in uh, in Charleston, it's in October, October 16th and 17th. It is on the topic, Who Owns America? It's a discussion of the book by the same title, of course, also the agrarians themselves, who wrote I'll Take My Stand in 1930, then expanded it in 1936. It is a great topic. We are talking about the same things today as they were talking about 90 years ago. And I think that's, I mean, that's what's missing in modern American society. We don't have any connection with the past. That connection has been broken And so it's easy to tear down monuments. It's easy to do the things that people are doing on the left because this is the goal of the left, and that is to create a a climate where you have year zero. There's nothing before this. It has always been the goal of the left because tradition is subversive to the leftist narrative. Tradition creates an environment where leftism cannot thrive, and so it has to do away with it. And that's, again, why the Southern tradition is valuable in modern American society. If we have that connection with the past and we understand it, we have different solutions to modern problems. One of the things that we did this week, which I think is interesting, we had two pieces that are working against the current popular narrative of the left. Now, one of them is on black slave owners. And this is a topic that, uh, I mean, we've talked about it before. I remember, and I've mentioned this on this podcast before, when I was uh, early in my career, I had a friend of mine came into my office. He wasn't a historian. He was just a, a guy that worked at the school. And uh, He came in my office, and he looked on my shelf, and I had the book Black Slave Owners by, uh, by Coger on my shelf. Now, this is a discussion of black slave owners in South Carolina, written by a, a black man. 
And I had it there, and it was just sitting there. And he looked at it, he looked over, and he said, black slave owners. I, I've never heard about that before. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, they existed. Now, Coger's position is different. The piece that we ran on Wednesday by Bo Trawick, Free Black Slave Owners, discusses Carter G. Woodson's work on black slave owners. And, of course, Carter G. Woodson is known as the father of black history. He's a Southerner, son of former slaves. Uh, has a doctorate from Harvard, or had a doctorate from Harvard, and uh, was the editor of the Journal of Negro History. But, of course, he is the founder of what's called Black History Month. I mean, first Black History Week, then Black History Month. And he went back and looked at the census record for 1830, and he compiled all the list of black slave owners in that census. And most of these listings, of course, are in the South, but they're also listing for black slave owners in places like Illinois and Maine and New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island. Wait, I thought they didn't have slavery in 1830. That's the narrative. They did. And so he found all these black slave owners. Now, in his opinion, most of these people were simply benevolent cases where they had purchased a family member to keep them out of slavery. But that's not the case everywhere. And what Coger found in his book, Black Slave Owners, and what he said over and over is that, look, I find benevolent slave owners, but most of the people who are slave owners in South Carolina that were black were doing it to make money. In other words, this was not some benevolent institution to keep people away from slavery. It was designed just as it was anywhere else, for the most part, to make a profit, to have a labor force so that you could grow cash crops. It didn't matter if these people were white or black. Now, of course, there's a lot of black slave owners in New Orleans. And there you had a very wealthy class of black Americans. Uh, and slavery there was different. The, the institution in New Orleans itself was different. You had, I mean, that's a whole other case study in and of itself. But you certainly had this pervasive black slave owning class in America. Thousands of them. Thousands of them. Not just a few, but thousands. Uh, and this is the unknown part of slavery. So the question then becomes, if this is the case, and there are all these black slave owners, well, what does that say about the institution of slavery, number one? And number two, when you start talking about political ramifications for this, now moving forward, is this a white-black issue or is it an institutional issue? Because you see, even when you had Liberia founded and Monrovia established, the free black slaves, American black slaves, who were sent to Liberia, enslaved the native population of Liberia. You see, so the institution was larger than just race. It's an institution that's been around since the beginning of history. This is it's not an excuse for it. It's not saying it's a benevolent or good institution. But it is there, and it was complex. And I think that's the part that we need to understand about Southern history, the complexity of Southern history the complexity of Southern history. It's not enough. Um, it's not enough to simply say this was a white-black issue. Now, in many cases, it was. But there's this other part to it. So as Trawick concludes, he says, somehow this important research on slavery by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history, has been cast down the Orwellian memory hole. By whom and why? When you take a course on slavery in America, you're not going to get much of this. I'm sure that people talk about it. But generally, the idea was, well, this is all benevolence. When you read Coger, though, you don't find that. When you look at slavery in New Orleans, you don't find that. When you look at some of the sugar plantations or in Louisiana where you had large black slave owners, you don't find that. You find people that were using slaves, black people that were using slaves, for the same reason that white people were using slaves, and that was as a labor force to make money. So this is the question of what history do you get and why? The same thing with the piece on Friday, Need to Know. It's about a former slave named Joseph Lee, 
who uh, was born in South Carolina. Now, the interesting, if you go out and look up Joseph Lee, a lot of websites that are, this is interesting part of it, that are, of course, that talk about Joseph Lee as the man who invented uh, bread-making machines, or at least a, a bread-making machine. When you look at Joseph Lee, you'll find that a lot of people list him as being born in Massachusetts. He wasn't. He was born a slave in South Carolina and eventually ended up in Massachusetts, where he established a couple of restaurants, some of the finest restaurants in Massachusetts. I think it was Massachusetts, or maybe it was Connecticut. I can't remember. Uh, Marcourt talks about it, Jack Marcourt. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, it was Massachusetts. Excuse me. Uh, so you have these restaurants, these nice restaurants in Massachusetts, which presidents frequented. Right? And these are owned by Joseph Lee. Now, Marcourt concludes at the end. He says, so the next time you buy a loaf of bread or a box of breadcrumbs at your local supermarket, remember that a former slave from South Carolina made it all possible well over a century ago. But we also hope that those who now take to the streets and social media with their cries of protests against an America that in their misguided way of thinking remains a nation of systemic, systemic racism, and who claim that they are all still the victims of slavery, might take just a moment to reflect on Americans such as Joseph Lee, who rose from true slavery to become respected members of their communities. Let the woke mob also remember that countless number of individuals from both African American and various other minority groups who have followed in their footsteps over the years, people who have done so by taking advantage of the equal rights and opportunities offered by the very systems the mindless mob now wishes to destroy. The question is, why isn't Joseph Lee talked about? Because Joseph Lee worked, and just like, I mean, Mark Hort talks about Booker T. Washington and others, because these individuals did not let, they didn't become victims with a capital V. Certainly they were victims of slavery with a lowercase v, but they were not victims with a capital V where they used that to simply complain and whine about things that they couldn't help. Joseph Lee went out and made something of himself. And a lot of people did this. Uh, so... But this history is distorted and then not told. Why? The question becomes why? Because it doesn't fit a narrative. It does not fit a narrative. And that narrative is, of course, an evil America. And more importantly, an evil South. Lee, of course, learned as a young man to be a baker. And then he spent time in, uh, he worked for the Office of Coast Survey, as a steward, uh, and of course that later became uh, Noah. Uh, he left that service in 1878 after he arrived uh, in Washington, D.C. So by 1890, he had these restaurants. I mean, this is an interesting history. A South Carolina, a native South Carolinian, born a slave, who makes something of himself, doesn't use it as a crutch or a detriment, but does something with it and becomes a very popular restaurant owner and not just that, an inventor. Uh, and he makes these need these machines that need bread, which is why the, the piece is need to know. He patented his device in 1902. So you have two pieces that work into that. And in so many ways... Roche's piece on Monday, The Remnant Part Two, gets into this distortion of history. In this particular piece, he talks about the Tampa Confederate Monument and the ceremony that was held in honor of that monument. And you don't see, you, you see them when it comes to, say, Silent Sam, because one of the speakers uh, said some racist things during, one of the during the dedication of the monument. And so that has been interpreted as being that Silent Sam Monument was all about racism. What you find in most of the addresses, and I've said this before on this podcast, is you nary have a reference to race or slavery or anything. It's about the men that these monuments honored and their courage, their steadfast devotion to people and place and country. I mean, the Confederacy was their country by popular elected governments. If we want to talk about 
government of the people, by the people, and for the people, then you're looking at that in the South. This was popular government. It was the legitimate government of the South. It was both de facto and de jure, in my opinion, but certainly de facto, if you want to argue about was secession legal or not, you could at least say it's de facto government. We say the Continental Congress before and then during the American War for Independence was the de facto and de jure government. The British did think did not think so, but we say it was. So were these governments not the de facto and de jure government? So these people were fighting for their government and were being honored for their sacrifices, tremendous sacrifices. We people don't understand the sacrifices that the South went through. And if they do know that there was tremendous destruction, they say they deserved it. That's where we are in 2020. It's sad. Uh, so I am I, I like this piece because it does that. And and I think this is something that we have to consider as we discuss Confederate monuments that most people have never read the dedication ceremonies. Most people don't know what they just look at it and say that's just racism. We're having one of the problems, of course, we, we face with the Abbeville Institute is having intellectual discussions with people who are anti intellectual. Uh, they are emotional. And these attacks on Confederate monuments are completely emotional. There's nothing intellectual about it, it's emotional. It's very hard to have a rational discussion with an emotional person. And this is where, you know, when, when you have uh, the Lincoln Project come out with a video, anti-Confederate flag video, that's one minute long, and it has things like, uh, this is the flag of treason. Donald Trump supports the flag of treason. You know, the people that fought under this flag were traitors. I mean, when you have that kind of stuff, that's an emotional argument. And, of course, our argument is a little more nuanced, and it takes, uh, takes a brain. <laughs> you can't just uh, have some type of emotional, reactionary response to it. And that is something that uh, in, people would say, well, then your argument's not valid. You get the Occam's razor thing. Well, then your argument's not valid because it's not simple. The simple argument's always the right argument. It's not true. It's not true at all. But certainly, uh, our argument is takes a little more intellectual depth to comprehend. It's just like uh, the other day when I pointed out to Stephanie McCurry that she was saying something that was incorrect about the Confederate Constitution. I made no mention that the South would have abolished slavery. I didn't say anything about what the war was about or slavery or anything, except asking, could the central authority abolish slavery in the South? Could I'm sorry, could the states abolish slavery in the South? But all of her little... Uh, brown-nosing minions uh, responded that, oh, here's the neo-Confederate talking about, uh, of course, they, 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 it's all about slavery. Uh, the war's all about slavery. I, didn't, I just asked a question about could, I didn't say the states would abolish slavery. I said they could abolish slavery. You see, this is the emotional reaction that people have. It's emotivism. It's what Al Alistair McIntyre pointed out in After Virtue. It's all emotivism. You have emotional arguments and then you have rational arguments. Our arguments are rational. They're reasoned. Calhoun talked about this in his Disquisition on Government. It's very hard to have rational arguments in a political system such as ours because emotion does become the guiding force for so many people, particularly when it's based on mere majority. But this, again, this is where we are in 2020. So I would say that James's piece, The Remnant 2, is certainly a rational piece. And he's attacking the emotivism of the people who are attacking these monuments. What we have to do is try to win some of these arguments. And we're working on those things. Again, the Abbeville Institute is working on those things behind the scene to try to combat the same emotional response with videos and things. We're working on them that are going to be the exact same type of stuff. Short, punchy little videos. and use the imagery and other things, very powerful things to try to, to push our agenda. And we will be having those. Again, those are coming soon. And so you will be able to support that effort financially if you would like, because we'd like to do a lot of them and we'd like to do them really well. So, uh, but I love that part of, of 
his piece because it does get into the dedication ceremony, which I think, I mean, you read these dedication speeches, they're beautiful. They're beautiful, and they are, many of them are in uh, the various, um, uh, the uh, Southern History Historical Society papers. Uh, they are just really good stuff, and you should take the time, if you can. Some of them were published in pamphlets. You can get these things, I mean, they're public domain. A lot of times, uh, you know, be at the Internet Archive, or you'll find them on Google Books. I mean, you find these pamphlets out there. It'd be great. Another project we've always wanted to do is to catalog all of these things and put them on our website so that they're there. Again, that's a financial requirement. So there's many things we'd like to do and many things that require help. Now, the other piece, one of the other pieces, uh, the Tuesday book review was actually a book review for the book that I just published, Southern Scribblings, written by yours truly. This is a collection of 60 essays that I've written in defense of the South and the Southern tradition. And it was reviewed by Ron Kennedy, which, backstory Ron Kennedy, uh, one of the ways that I actually entered into this, what I do now, is with the Kennedy brothers. Now, I had an advisor as an undergraduate who certainly was uh, very interested in the Southern tradition and what it meant. He wrote a great book on Maryland, The South's First Casualty. But I remember back... Uh, it was about 1996, I guess, 95, somewhere in there. Uh, and I picked up Why Not Freedom, which was written by the Kennedys. I had not read The South of Right at that point. I picked up Why Not Freedom. And I remember reading this. Of course, this is on the heels of the Republican Revolution of 94, and I was you know, interested in that. And I remember reading this book, and I thought, wow. I mean, this, he's saying things that I didn't think about. And I remember I was a little bit turned off by a couple of the things, and one of them was um, the fact that the Kennedys argued for nullification and even perhaps secession. This book was, I mean, I picked it up in a Barnes & Noble or Books a Million, something like that. And I thought, my gosh, I've never seen this before. And so it became a quest for me to learn more about this. So the Kennedys, for me, even though they will say that all of the scholars that, you know, they've, they've, they've published these books and so many scholars have written things that they appreciate and are part of, of, their, of their intellectual growth as well, and they kindly cite me at times. Of course, I didn't have anything to do with that, but they kindly cite me in some things that I've done at times. I don't, I don't know what I've done to help them but I can honestly say they have done much. To, and, of course, the Kennedys make great speeches. If you've never seen them make a speech, they make great speeches. And so Ron Kennedy kindly reviewed my book here. And, look, the book is designed as a defense of the South and the Southern tradition and what it means, things like secession, uh, things like Southern culture. One, one of the best essays in it, of course, is the defense of Robert E. Lee. There's, there's a couple defenses of Lee. There's a couple defenses of Calhoun in this book. Because I think it's essential to understand who these people are and what they mean for America. So if you would be so inclined to buy the book, Southern Scribblings, I would greatly appreciate it. And to leave a review at Amazon. Or, you know, that's the only place you can get it currently is at Amazon. So it's a, it was uh, the culmination of many years of writing about these things. And, and um, I would hope you would enjoy it. And with that said, uh, the last piece of the week is a continuation of Clyde Wilson's Southern Poets in Poetry series. And in this particular case, it's from Theodore O'Hara. Now, He's from Kentucky, but spent a lot of time in Alabama. In fact, the most famous poem that he ever wrote, The Bivouac of the Dead, was first published in Alabama about 1858. And he died, Theodore Harris, of course, survived the war, died in 1867. He died in Columbus, Georgia. Now, I spent a lot of time in that part of the South, and he was buried at one point in Columbus, probably, I believe at Linwood Cemetery, which is the old cemetery in town, and then in later re-interned. Um, but 
uh, so he actually got involved in uh, some various industrial pursuits after the war was over. But Theodore O'Hara wrote two really good poems, and, and uh, Clyde published them here. The Bivouac of the Dead was written to commemorate soldiers who died in the Mexican War, the Kentucky volunteers he fought with in the Mexican War. And, of course, uh, O'Hara was with Albert Sidney Johnston, the great Confederate general, when he was wounded in, uh, in Tennessee and died. Uh, but I love, I mean, look, this poem is fantastic. It's actually been co-opted by the United States and is used at Arlington Cemetery now because it is just a beautiful poem about heroism and valor and honor and what a cemetery, a soldier's cemetery, actually means. So I'm going to go through it. Of course, I, am, I do not claim to be a great uh, reader of poetry, but I'll do my best. And the other poem is the, the Old Pioneer, and I love this because, and I think the reason why Clyde picked it for the, for the week is the southern theme of rugged individualism. The, the bivouac of the dead, of course, is southern southern theme of the martial spirit, the heroism of the South. In all wars, I mean, you go across the board, you find that the South has been important and essential in defending the United States. But the rugged pioneer, the, the old pioneer, the rugged individualist, Daniel Boone, David Crockett, that is also the South. George Washington. People don't, people don't realize how much of a rugged individual as George Washington actually was. So here we go. The Bivouac of the Dead by Theodore O'Hara. The muffled drum's sad roll has beat the soldier's last tattoo. No more on life's parade shall meet that brave and fallen few. On fame's eternal camping ground, their silent tents to spread and glory guards with solemn round, the bivouac of the dead. No rumor of the foe's advance now swells upon the wind, nor troubled thought at midnight haunts of loved ones left behind. No vision of the morrow's strife, the warrior's dreams alarms, no brang horn or screaming fife at dawn shall call to arms. Their shriveled swords are red with rust, their plumed heads are bowed. Their haughty banner, trailed in dust, is now their martial shroud. And plenteous funeral tears have washed the red stains from each brow. And the proud forms by battle gashed are free from anguish now. The neighing troop, the flashing blade, the bugle's stirring blast, the charge, the dreadful cannonade, the dinned and shout are past. Nor war's wild note, nor glory's peal shall thrill with fierce delight those breasts that nevermore may feel the rapture of the fight. Like the fierce northern hurricane that sweeps the, ga the great plateau, flushed with triumph yet to gain, come down the serried foe, who heard the thunder of the fray break o'er the field beneath, knew the watchword of the day was victory or death. Long had the doubtful conflict raged o'er that stricken plain, for never fiercer fight had waged the vengeful, vengeful blood of Spain, and still the storm of battle blew, still swelled the glory tide. Not long our stout old chieftain knew such odds his strength could bide. T'was in that hour his stern command called to martyr's grave, the flower of his beloved land the nation slagged to save. By rivers of their father's gore his firstborn laurels grew, and well he deemed the sons would pour their lives for glory too. For many a mother's breath has swept over, over Angorsta's plain, and long the pitying sky has wept above its moldered slain. The raven's scream or eagle's flight, or shepherd's pensive, pensive lay, alone awakes each sullen height that frown over that dreadful that dread fray. Sons of the dark and bloody ground, ye must not slumber there, where Stranger steps and tongues resound along the heedless air. Your own proud land's heroic soil shall be your fitter grave. She claims from war her richest spoil, the ashes of her brave. Thus neath their patent turf they rest, 
far from the glory field, born to a Spartan's mother's breast on many a bloody shield. The sunshine of their native skies smiles sadly on them here, and kindred eyes and hearts watch by the hero's sepulcher. Rest on embalmed and sainted dead, dear as the blood ye gave. No impious footsteps here shall tread the herbage of your grade, nor shall your glory be forgot while fame her record keeps, for honor points the hallowed spot where valor proudly sleeps. Yon marble's minstrel's voice, voiceless stone and deathless song shall tell when many a vanquished ago has flown the story of how ye fell. No wreck, nor change, nor winter's blight, nor time's remorseless doom can dim one ray of glory's light that gilds your deathless tomb. So, The Old Pioneer, and I'm not going to read that one. The Old Pioneer is, again, a story of the energy, the boundless energy that Southerners found in this quest to settle the West. And I think, again, that speaks to, again, rugged individualism, but also the Southern impact on the frontier and how important that was long term. That is a part of the Southern tradition that's often forgotten. The West really was the South in many ways. So read it, The Old Pioneer, because Theodore O'Hare, I think, a good, did a good job capturing the spirit of that frontiersman. All right, well, that's it for the Week in Review at the Abbey of Until next time, good day.